Thank you so much. I'm so blessed to be here and I'm so excited to catch up with you because it has been such a long time that we've seen each other face to face, even though it's only, you know, online. And uh, I'm so excited to be able to share a bit of my story. And um, yeah, hopefully I, I can, you know, people who are listening, there's beautiful women that are listening will be able to relate and uh, hear themselves in, in what I've learned, the wisdom that I've gained through the, through the pain. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. What's really, really awesome about what you've learned is now you are helping other people. So I think we call you a transformational coach. Is that is that what is that what we call you? <laughs> like you want to? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've always found that, it so <laughs> unpack. I've always found it so difficult to label what I do because I can help people with so many things. And yeah, but transformational work is really the heart of it. Mindset mentor. I work with people at an identity level. So you know, a lot of people might refer to me as a life coach as well. But again, I don't like to use that either because I don't know, like I, I, I can, I help people in business. I help entrepreneurs, but mostly uh, as a transformational coach, I develop, I train and develop transformational coaches as well. So they could be going off and working in the context of health and um, and wellness, or they could be working in my, you know, mindset or, working with health related um healing you know healing yeah. healing components and and of course business side of things as well but ultimately yeah i help people look at what's going on for them in their world like what is what is the presenting problem i work with a lot of women to help them really take back their power and um because it's such a thing that we do we we have so much conditioning around um you know doing everything for everybody else and and putting everyone else first and there's a lot of you know pedestaling around that as well you know like if I do that then I'm valued then I'm loved and uh, we just forget about ourselves and we sacrifice ourselves and I've definitely done that and experienced that and uh, it just breaks my heart when I see women that want to go after something and they have a vision or a mission or a dream on their heart but they use all of the reasons why they can't uh to to not go after it and and ultimately hand over their power to the things external to themselves so that's yeah. really yeah yeah i think this is a real theme today especially with gen x women that they are cognizant that that is the situation that we have grown up to believe that we should be taking care of everyone else and once everyone else is okay then maybe we'll be okay and yeah, that we're accepted because we do all these things for our family. And if we decide to put ourselves first, then whoa, all the judgment, all of that stuff that comes in, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you've had some significant challenges in the last few years. And obviously being your friend, living in a different country, feeling um, the pain of what you've been through. Uh, are you happy to share some of the challenges yeah. I just feel like a lot of women can really relate or anyone listening will will really relate to these challenges mm, yeah I'll, I'll take back just a little bit further from the moment of being in Bangkok I was had been coaching I'd been running my coaching and training business for close to 12 months full-time I just retired from the fitness industry so it was 2018 October of 2018 I had this moment um, where I had been working extremely hard. My daughter was only two years old and I loved what I did so much. I dreamed of being an entrepreneur full-time and, and running my business in the way that I thought I needed to run it. You know, it was like I wanted freedom, I wanted independence, I wanted to really make a difference and, and work with people intimately in terms of their own self-development and self-mastery and their growth and achieving their dreams but I found that I was shutting the door closing you know closing the door to my daughter who's out there going mommy you know I want to hang out with you I want to play with you and I'm like I've, I've got to close the door and go into my office and work and I that broke my heart and I thought wow this this dream that I had and this business that I signed up for uh, actually was creating a lot of distress inside of me and I was helping so many other people yet I was drinking a bottle of wine a night to get to get through I was not working out anymore because I had this really weird relationship with fitness after retiring from it and feeling as though I was just pushing my body for so many years and not listening to it and not taking care of it and just doing what I had to do because that was what I did 
and I've lost this like passion for my own health and my own wellness and so it was this breaking point where I hit rock bottom and I said and I and I was just lost I was like I don't know who I am anymore and I don't know what I want and I just can't do this anymore and I had this intuitive message that came through um, being very connected to energy and source and it was like move back to Australia and I thought what the heck this is ridiculous I don't want to move back to Australia I've got lots of baggage back there you know I don't want to go and deal with that um and uh I'd left 17 years prior with my ex-husband who had been uh very quickly I like, had been um arrested and uh we fled the country and so you know there was lots of things that I had to deal with in coming back here and I just there was a lot of fear around it I wanted to move to, to Spain. I wanted to travel for the other six, like six months of the year living in Spain and the other six months to travel the world and world school our daughter. But uh, moved back to Australia, I thought, what is this? But I, um, after a few days of really sitting with it and I heard it again, I was like, okay, there's something in this. Uh, I'm going to listen. And so we packed everything up, moved to Australia with four bags and sent a few boxes over and restarted our life. And that in itself was so challenging because, and I think not enough people speak about it and Trace, I'm sure you can really relate to it having done it as well. Like no, no, no one really speaks about how challenging it can be to relocate back to your home country after being away for such a long time. It's difficult to move to other countries as well, <laughs> you know, to learn the culture and navigate all of that, but also readjusting back into your own culture that yeah, you're really a whole different person as well. Oh, exactly. And you've had so much experiences that have taught you so many skills of which like speed, fast decision making, resilience, um, multiple cultures, and you just come back and you just, and you, it's hard. Yeah. Right? It's so hard. Yeah. Yeah. And a bit of, you know, first world problems too. I was like, I've had a nanny and a helper for seven, you know, for all my life. What? I've got to cook and clean. What? Really? Ah, <laughs> That's new too, right? And and you can relate to that too, I'm sure. And yeah, but aside from that, you know, it was just, like you said, I'm a different person. And I felt very disconnected from this place. I just felt like I wasn't from here. I felt like Th Thailand was my home. I just, so it was a very deep transformational period for me. And I stopped coaching for a little while because of it. And um, I just needed a break. And so, but then, um, navigating all of the challenges with that and setting my life back up again you know even little things like I had no credit rating I had no rental history you know things like that like okay I feel like I'm just like no one here I'm starting from nothing and no one and I don't even I can't even rent a house you know like so there's those little challenges too that I had to or obstacles I, that I had to navigate through and um, you know and then there's all the health things too but the biggest challenge I think that I was really confronted with um, in November of 2019 uh, was the passing of my ex-husband. So we were married for 11 years. We had a, a you know, a, a epic story and we went through so much together and had a very deep connection because of that. And we were still best friends. And so he had a heart attack. Uh, so it was very sudden. He had messaged me saying that he had had some pains and, you know, we were in touch that the, the day of and, he was going to go to the doctor that night, went for a walk and that's it. It was the end of the story. And um, so losing him was a very big shock. And uh, and then 11 days later, my mum passed away. And so she'd been, yeah, she was in hospital. She went, she'd been sick for quite some time, like many years. She was um, facing off with her cancer. She had multiple myeloma and uh, was, there's no medical cure. So she was in all of the programs to you know get whatever drugs that they had and um she was going really well and so kind of every three or four years the drug would start to not work anymore and then she'd go on to the next one and but she'd gotten really sick and she went into hospital and um ended up kind of getting worse because she got another infection from being in hospital and she was due to go on to a next round of drug of drugs and that was um what they called the Hail Mary and it was basically the, the only and the last one that they they had but because of the infection that she had they couldn't start the treatment so she just went downhill so fast and that too was really hard to accept and very quick to have to deal with and not only that it was in the middle of COVID and 
um, I was in a very difficult situation because the choices that I made, she was in Sydney, I was in, in Queensland and the borders were still closed at the time. And so it was just like all of the things that I had to navigate with getting down to see her and getting into the hospital to see her, you know, the, the disagreements with my brothers and me of my opinions versus their opinions and so on and so on. And it was so much to navigate and not only losing her, but then also having to deal with, um, can I be at her funeral, still being a stand for that? You know, because at the time, because I've chosen non, to be non-vaccinated, it was that if I was there, she could only have 20 or we could only have 20 people in the room. And my brothers were like, she knows hundreds of people because she's a well-known person in her community. Her tennis courts are named after her, you know, big, big person in tennis. And so, you know, there was hundreds of people that they wanted to have there. And they were like, well, if you come, none of those people can be there. And it was just like, oh, so, you know, navigating all the things that have created a lot of conflict between families and so it was the loss of mum and then it was the loss of relationships with my brothers and it just felt like so much loss all at once you know and so I just I had to stop it was like I was forced to, to stop and I think a lot of times I guess I'm grateful that I was in the situation where I could but a lot of times people can't and they have to keep going and just oh, well, what I say, operate over the top, you know, stuff the emotions down and just carry on, you know, put on a brave face and you'll be right, you know, and that's a lot of the mentality around grief. And I didn't respect grief in the way that I now do. Yeah. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. and, and there is so much of a mentality around you get over it or just, you know, like six months later, get over it. You know, it's more like 18 months later and of course I'm not still over it I, I've definitely done a lot of work around it and I'm got constantly doing healing work around it and I have these moments but it was at least 12 months that and, and I stopped and I actually was with my grief and I was able to feel it and be with it and know what was going on but I also am grateful that I have the emotional intelligence to be able to do that because of my training because of my background um, which is is in your linguistic programming and emotional work emotional release work and um yeah so but the good thing is now I'm on the other side of it and you know, yeah. I'm back into my business and I feel like I've just changed so much I've evolved so much I feel very grateful for the experience because I have so much compassion and understanding now for other people and who are going through it and I would never say anything like that to anyone you know anymore and you know just reaching out and saying I you know I how's your heart how are you feeling today like what I'm here for you if you if you if you want to just like know that there's there's a friend that cares and that, that is there because sometimes people don't even know how to be you know respond or say they don't know what to say so they just don't yeah. say anything at all and that is heartbreaking too because you're like oh this person hasn't reached out to me you know so there's just so many pieces of obstacles that are along that 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 grief journey and um and I think even if if we haven't lost somebody that's significant because you know, losing a parent is next level. Um, all of us have gone through grief over the last few years at some level because grief ultimately is when there is a change to our life, you know, like moving yeah. country, moving city, a parent leaving, a separation breaking up, right? Lots of conflict in relationships through what we've been through over the last few years. And so losing, losing any kind of relationship, all of that equals grief there's a process that we need to go through and so I think that conversation even though I'm not an expert at grief that conversation is so important for us to have and to know how to be with others and be with ourselves through that journey yeah hey Judy I will call this an epic love story because we're about to get to the love but through epic love stories there is those massive hurdles I'm so touched that you've shared that with me and like whoa <laughs> Yeah, well, is that I don't have a response, and but I'm feeling it. So, thank you for sharing that. That's that's huge. I'm sure that there are lots of people that can relate to this. Um, and you know, grief when we're at the stage of life and all these things are hitting us left, right, and centre. Grief with our physical, mental bodies changing, 
oh, as well. Like that's time. actually been something for me, like that realization that I don't have full control over what's happening with my body, that hormones will do what they will do. And now I see it from a lens of, hey, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Versus what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> You know? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I want to add in there because I, I, I'm so, so happy for you that you're following this path and you're doing this work because I feel like this is just so, you know, like this message is so important. What you're sharing, what you're doing, your book, your podcast, everything that you are, who you are and the message that you're sharing is so essential. And that comes from me knowing when I hit this, you know, perimenopause place, I was, I didn't know. I'm like, what what's going on all the things that used to work for yeah. me are not working yeah. you know and well, fitness professionals yeah yeah, and yeah. coming from that and then you know I, I had this transition into my coaching training business as I said I had this really weird relationship with my own health and my own fitness journey because of what I'd been through and because of that and then not working out and not taking care of my body then being in this highly stressed state mm. financial stress like being the main income earner taking all the pressure on myself creating that for myself you know putting ourselves Brooklyn in the best schools you know doing all of that that created that pressure but then it was like coming back to Australia and again restarting like the stress the the pressure that that created and then I was in my early 40s and I was my body wasn't being taken care of, but not only that, the hormones were, you know, were, were all doing what they were doing and the stress also combined with that, um, being in this fight flight state has just created havoc and I've gained so much weight and, and like you say, like the grief of, wow, like my body, like uh, I don't know this body. I really don't know this body and who am I now? And all of the expectations of, mm. I was in the health and fitness industry for 23 years, like so much shame, actually. What are people thinking of me? What, you know, and it was, of course, a lot of self-judgment, but then also yeah. feeling judgment externally as well, because which some of it I was making up and some of it was real. Some of it's real. I, I think mm. I cover that a little bit as well. You know, the fitness industry with just, there isn't really a whole lot of marketing for us. No. <laughs> You know, and that's cool. I'm like, I'm so like, you know, I've done the work, I'm over it. And now I'm just going to make it work for myself, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, just this, we are, we are not a niche. Every woman will experience that sort of thing. So mm. anyway, I want to touch on the emotions. There's a lot of emotional stuff here. Mm. And I think I'm going to like use the situation that you're my friend and I know that most people pay hundreds of dollars for this conversation so <laughs> here we go awesome. here's my question Bring so it. adversity so you know how do you make this a superpower like how do you what tools do you use to recognize emotions in in the situation and even make a head start towards the light mm, amazing question Hmm. everything comes back to consciousness so it comes back to awareness so the work that I do with my clients and the coaches that I train is ultimately all about that and not only that but then bringing in an integration between our conscious mind so our conscious mind our thinking our analytical mind the one that makes you know our dreams up and uh, ultimately the one the ones that lead us to make you know, we make our decisions from um and then our unconscious or some people call subconscious is is our feelings it's it's our natural or, you know, response to things our behaviors um and so what's happened is we've become so fragmented we've gone through experiences in our life traumatic experiences significant emotional events that have created emotions and we've where we've made decisions that have formed into beliefs about ourselves for an example for me when I was six years old and my dad left so mum called all of us kids into the into the um lounge room I I walk in sit down, down beside my three brothers and mum and dad sit opposite us and mum says dad's leaving and in that moment I, I couldn't believe it. I was in shock and I start crying and I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean he's leaving? Why? 
he's my hero. Where is he going? Like, what? And you know, run to my room, I'm screaming, I'm crying uncontrollably. But in that moment, I actually made it mean that I'm not good enough for him to stay, right? So it's these events that create these belief systems and emotions. And then from there, so as an early age, then having the emotions and then, of course, grief that because uh, now my dad's leaving right now, my whole environment's changed. And the thing that I used to get so excited about him coming home, bringing a Smurf from me for me from the BP, um, you know, that's no longer there. And so how do I know how to handle that? Well, I don't. I'm six years old. I don't have emotional intelligence, right? We don't have that capacity. We get that from our parents. And if our parents don't know how to regulate their own emotions and be with their own emotions and be with others when they're in their emotions, then how am I ever going to learn it? And so I grew up feeling very unsupported um, because my mom didn't have that capacity and didn't have that emotional intelligence. So what I've had to learn through adversity are different tools and I've had to um, you know, apply these tools. So when I was in Bali and um, my whole life, you know, I, I'm in a foreign country. I, I have no way of going home. I don't even know if I can go home. And again, it was this massive feeling of uh, complete unknown, so much uncertainty, feeling depressed. And I gave up on my dream. I, I, just, I was just like in this pool of mess. And, but again, I, used meditate I started that was where I started meditation so that was back in 2002 um when we'd left Australia so you know, 2003 I started meditating and just being with the stillness sitting in nature I'd sit I'd sit you know find this beautiful spot because Bali is so beautiful because the sun sets you know right over the ocean and you know I'd sit there in the afternoons and watch the sunset I'd look out to the ocean and just get taken away by the wonder of the unknown I'd be like wow look there's so much that's unknown underneath the ocean but there's so much cool stuff there and there's so much that like it, disruption as well right and I would just contemplate and I would reflect and I would just yeah like be be in the stillness and, and it was very messy in the beginning right so um I think what I've had to learn over the years is that I was very disconnected from my emotions so kind of bringing in where we go through these events in order for us to handle what we're going through, it's like our unconscious mind is there to run the body, preserve our, our, the body and, and, and help us ultimately. And so what it supports us to do in order to function and carry on and protect us is repress the emotions. And so a lot of us have repressed emotions that are unresolved and that because of that shutting down of our, that part of ourselves, our emotional part, then end our conditioning because we may have been told, you know, um, be seen and not heard, um, you know, um, don't be so loud, uh, don't cry, it's okay, right? Like we get told not to do the thing, but crying is amazing. It's so healing, right? But we, we learn that's not okay. Or if we're angry, you know, if we're losing it at, as little kids in the shopping mall and completely just having having our emotions ultimately is what it is expressing because that's what kids do really well they have no filter they don't care because they don't have that you know kind of self-doubting part of themselves at that point it's just like I'm feeling this emotion and I want to express it and so it was like we've we've we have to unlearn that piece of being told not to do that and and learn how to be with our emotions and ultimately a lot of it comes from just slowing down it comes from being still because we have so many distractions right now and we use those distractions to also not feel it could be food it could be alcohol it could be you know netflix or our phone or whatever it might be and so those distractions just keep us in the, in the you know in the not feeling and so either you know meditating or even just slowing down and just being and just being in nature and con you know contemplating and just being in the moment it allows us to actually start to connect inwards to our to our body and be present with what is there and a big thing that we have to learn and what I help my clients learn is that the thing that you fear the most is not going to kill you 
And the thing that you fear the most is how you, how you feel or how you will feel, the emotions, you know. And that's why I feel so many people go looking for the solution of, oh, I'm feeling that something is wrong with me. I'm broken. Something's wrong with me. And then they go you know, to GPs or whatever to say, this is my symptom what's wrong with me and they'll you know a lot of times medicate you know give you a drug to deal with the symptom but the symptom is not the problem and so what I do with my clients and what I teach my coaches to do is our work is about getting to the root cause of the problem what's really going on and a lot of times it's emotions that are just repressed in the body that's limiting beliefs that we have about ourselves like I'm not good enough I'm not capable I'm not successful I can never have what I want I, I I'm embarrassed I'm shame I'm I'm scared whatever um, and then supporting them to know that they can be with those emotions and they can, um, that, that they're going to be okay because emotions actually do move very quickly through our body and we're not broken and we don't need to be fixed and we're all okay. And it's just knowing that you, ultimately it's creating safety in the body as well. Yeah. So we're kind of yeah. talking about the mind body connection here, really. Like I, I feel like over the years, possibly the last couple of years, <laughs> since I moved back to New Zealand and, you know, going through a uh, suppressed trauma of moving, I think, mm. um, and things sort of would come up occasionally. Um, but I would get, you know, like headaches and fatigue and stuff that were not linked to day-to-day -day living. So is that sort of a situation where there's sort of repressed emotions and then like a week down the track, I would be like, <laughs> I miss my fridge, I miss the food, I miss the climate, I miss, I miss it all. It all just kind, kind of comes bubbling up to the surface, have a bloody good cry yep. and then I feel better. But yep. leading up to it is just all these physical symptoms. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's all about the mind-body connection because it, our body is made up of neurons, right? And and neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters beat every single cell in the body. And this concept was written about by um, Deepak Chopra in his book, Quantum Healing. Um, and he was really one of the first doctors to really speak about it, I believe, like and write about it. And and he said that neurotrans, originally they thought neurotransmitters only were only in the brain. But through researching, the they realized <laughs> actually, yeah, the rats there. <laughs> they realized that neurotransmitters bathe every single cell in the body because they cut out the brain, the brain stem first, you know, they, they make the rat run through the maze to find the cheese. They can still do it. And then they start cutting out parts of the brain and, and they can still do it. Why? Cause it's, it's in their body, right? Yeah. It's the same with us. Like everything we do is actually in our body. Now we wake up, we grab our phone we, or whatever it is that we do. First thing we do, we don't have to think about it. We just do it because all habit actually runs unconsciously. All our behavior runs unconsciously. We might consciously think about it first, certain things like, you know, learning to drive a car. You might consciously need to learn certain steps. But uh, through repetition, it then gets delegated to the unconscious mind. And now we just do it without thinking. And it's the same thing with every single pattern, every single behavior. And so that is the evidence that of this mind-body connection. And yes, in, in, from an NLP perspective, neuro-linguistic programming, we also teach meta-healing. And um, again, this ties in with, you know, there's a lot of research around this, that every single um, illness or dis-ease, you know, and we separate, we say dis-ease because yep. of dissociation to create ease, right? So it's like what I said to you before about we repress all of these emotions. But the other role of the unconscious mind is actually bring them back up to the surface for resolution. So it's going to bring it back up in a headache or, a, you know, a fatigue or a, um, some other kind of dis-ease or it could be um, an event, you know, in our relationships. Something happens, we, we get activated by somebody else and we feel an emotion, it gets brought up. And what we tend to do is point the finger and yeah. say, oh, you know, or we treat the symptom. Oh, I have a headache. Oh, I'll take a tablet rather than look down deep into, well, what is causing this? What's causing this? Yeah. What am I not aware of? Because it is signals from the unconscious mind to say this emotion is one you've got to look at. Or, you know, this headache is showing you, it's like, like an alarm bell saying, hello, listen, pay attention. There's something here that you need to pay attention to. 
And it's not the headache, by the way, right? Like, and so, but doing that work, it, it, it does. It requires, like you say, like having a big cry. And if we're not allowing ourselves to be, or we've learned that that's not okay, we just keep finding other ways to, to, to regulate our nervous system. And that's where, you know, like a hit on the phone, a dopamine hit is like, oh, that feels really good. Yeah, I want, I want more of that. Or having some chocolate. Oh, I have it, right? That's, that, that's how we're coping. And that's what we're doing. We're just coping. We're managing it, but we're not actually dealing with what's really going on. Yeah. So this brings me to the questions on inner critic, because I think there's a link between um, physical and mental health and how your body copes with, you know, when you're mentally struggling and then your body starts struggling. But I, I sort of, where am I going? So I'm kind of thinking like a lot of this is about the things that we tell ourselves as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, you know, our thoughts, like we have around about 90,000 thoughts a day. The majority of those are not what we want, right? They're negative in nature. And, but it's all linked, right? Because the way that I teach it is, Every, every event that we have that's external to us, right, we take it in and we take it in through all of our senses. So, you know, our visual, auditory, our kinesthetic our feeling, our olfactory, which is our smell, and our gustatory, our taste, and our internal dialogue. So there's those six senses that we use to take in the information. And what's happening is in, in like every single second, we actually have, like, there's so much information coming at us like billions of bits of information coming at us every single second. And we have to filter that information because it's too much for us. But we're, the way that we filter that is through our lens, right? Through our values and our attitudes and our belief systems and our attitude and our what we call meta programs, which is part of our personality, language, time, space, matter, energy. All these things is what we're using to filter it. And it's based on us, it's, which ultimately is based on our own conditioning, our experiences that we've taken on, that we've learned to be our truth, which it may not be, <laughs> and but it's it's what it is for us now, right? And so we filter that information, and inside of our head, we make a picture. We have an internal representation. We see pictures. We hear sounds. We have the internal voice. We have feelings, sensations, perhaps, and that's immediately coupled with state. Immediately coupled with physiology, and then that leads to our behavior. And so everything in terms of what we're seeing in our external world, right, there's this feedback loop. It's just looping around and around and around. So, you know, it's like our we are the projector projecting out onto a movie screen our life, our, our experience based on our model of the world, like our filters, our, our film that we're putting out there. And so there's this feedback loop. And so, the, and also the way that we wired as human beings is to look for the negative because we're looking to stay safe. And that's part of, yeah, as part of our primary response is to stay alive. And so because we're kind of wired and geared that way and we aren't trained to train our mind the same way we're trained to train our bodies, <laughs> you know, go to the gym, re-regular, like get in there. We have to train our minds in the same way. If we just let our inner critic fire off and do what it does and say all the things that it says and judge ourselves and criticize others and ourselves blah, 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 and just let it run havoc, well, it owns you. It has yeah, you. We're fucked, you know? basically. <laughs> yeah, it runs the show. You know, it's yeah. like, well, who's driving the bus, right? If you want to change your life, change the internal dialogue. And it can be done through different ways. We can do it through working with the emotions and the beliefs and kind of do it that way. But we can also, you know, if you're working with a coach, it's that, that is helpful. It's yeah. a lot faster. Um, it, but if you don't have the resources to do that at the moment, well, what you do is you do it from the other way and you start being very aware. As I said from the beginning, it's all about awareness. So if, rather than just unconsciously letting your mind do what it does and say what it says, you know, you're in a shop, you're like, oh, that's expensive. Or, you know, you're looking in the mirror and you're like, oh, that's great. You know, you're so fat or whatever we say, right? We have these things and we don't even realize that we're doing it until we become aware and conscious that we're doing it. And once we are, then we need to commit and make the commitment to change that internal dialogue. And so we, we call that reframing rather yeah. than saying, oh, you know, I'm not happy with how that looks. Then we can say, well, I can, you know, I'm choosing today to make better choices or, you know, whatever it is and something that feels really realistic. 
because it, you know, we have control. We don't have control as, as to what the scale's doing or whatever, but we have control as to our actions and our behaviors of how we then deal with what it's saying in terms of our weight or in terms of whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I think that commitment is really key. And sometimes people say to me, Judy, you know, like, cause I'm so authentic about my life and my experience around it. I'm like, I'm not a guru. I'm not perfect. I'm still working on it just like you. I may be a few steps ahead, but it is a daily commitment. Like committing to go to the gym is a daily commitment. Committing to make a commitment to ourselves and make different choices from moment to moment to moment is a process of committing, recommitting and recommitting and recommitting again. Yeah. And I think I've had to learn that, you know, in my health because my health, my body has always just been so easy for me. My whole life was like, I was just fit. I was athletic. I, was, I, I did what I did for my life. You know, I didn't have to work on it at all because it was what I did. But now I have had to face off with this aspect of myself, which I know is from my own personal growth and evolution. And I've had to apply all the things that I've done in other areas of my life, like business and relationships and things. And now I apply it to my health and go, okay, well, now I have to, you know, practice what I preach, you know, what I teach others. I need to apply that into my health. And I've had to realize that um, I'd gone down this road of, I don't know what to do. I don't have the support. I just like, my body is not the same anymore. I like, don't have the right help, but you know, all the stories that we make up. And, and then because it felt so hard, and I wasn't seeing the results straight away, which is what I was so used to, then I would just stop. I'd give up. But that's not that's not recommitting. I'm not practicing what I preach in that area. I've had to really learn that. And I get that now and I'm making different choices. So, yeah, and it's like being okay with, uh, I made that commitment. I didn't do it. It's okay. I'm I'm human. And, and, and rather than just going, oh, well, you know, I might as well not do it anymore and no, may as well not take care of my health and eat the right foods and work out. Instead, I'm going to recommit and say, you know, I dropped the ball there and that's okay. And now my next choice is this. Yeah. Amazing, Judy. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to take it from the point where you stepped away after, you know, losing your mum and getting to where you are now. So it's really cool when you do sort of an interview like this and someone asks you that, like they go, okay, so that happened. And then you've obviously had a massive learning curve, lots of growth, put it into practice. So where are you at today? Who is Judy today? Oh gosh, who am I today? <laughs> Sorry, big question. <laughs> I know, I know. I feel like I'm a lot wiser. I feel like I, you know, I am a compassionate, deeply um, loving and understanding woman who I've been able to use this time to not only heal the loss, the losses, but also to um, continue my own healing and continue to evolve myself and my own journey and I've allowed because I've had the time to slow down in the space like I really love spaciousness because I came from working as you know we're the same trace you know working our bums off you know it was like our mentality was you know go hard or go home right like no <laughs> no matter how hard even if you played hard you, know, you had to show back up the next day and you know go hard at it and so that was the mentality that I had and it didn't serve me well ultimately because it led to burnout. And so those quiet moments allowed me to like really slow down and be patient, be patient with myself, be patient with my journey. As a big visionary, I always wanted to be further ahead. I've always wanted to um, yeah, be further ahead than what I was and never satisfied with where I was. And I've learned and I'm still learning to be really appreciative and honor myself for where I am and what I have been through. And I think, um, yeah, that, you know, losing mum has, has supported me to do that. And, um, and of course, th within that has been about prioritizing my lifestyle lifestyle and prioritizing the things that are really important to me as well which is time with my family and being really present with Brooklyn uh you know going from really just kind of shutting the door and working extremely hard to now going 
well, this this matters. This is really important. This is a priority. And we're going we're going away for three days together, Brooklyn and I, to Prana Fest here in the Sunshine Coast, and we're just gonna have so much fun and do dances and healings and you know stuff like that. And so our lifestyle is, you know, just a really important part. And I think sometimes we're chasing, and I was chasing this big dream and sacrificing myself in the process. Mm-hmm. And so now. I'm not. And now I'm committing to myself on all areas of my life and being patient along the way, along the way and knowing that it doesn't matter how long it takes to get there because I'm going to get there um, and knowing that within myself. And that can be really difficult as an entrepreneur because there's so much projection of that faster, harder, you should be here, you know, you should be at this, this income, whatever, whatever. But it's like no one really tells you that it's okay to not. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's okay. we're definitely in the same in the same uh, lane, (laughs) the entrepreneurial journey. And both of us, you know, the patience thing has never been a good thing. I think, you know, for for, once again, both of us living in very fast action-packed cities, you just grow into it and that becomes your new modus operandi, you know? And then when you, you know, for both of us, extracting ourselves from that situation and moving to, you know, our home countries and having to dial it down and, used to going so fast and getting so frustrated that things aren't going faster and then realizing that actually you get to get up another day and do the thing you freaking love that's the blessing yeah and it gives you a bit more space to enjoy it like I don't know if you remember this is just a thing I remember as well is that you know we do quarterly workshops every three months somewhere around Asia multiple times I remember having a moment thinking oh God, we've just finished the last lot and now we're preparing for the next lot. And I don't remember feeling the joy of it. You know, I don't, there were so many highs and I don't remember having the emotions of, look at that, that's amazing. Or how incredible is that? Because we're just going on to the next thing. And that's one of the cool things about getting to this sort of stage of life and extracting yourself from the busy, being more patient. You really, really notice the little things, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you think of our kids, right? Like what do yeah. they care about? Like they care about time. Pump the pump uh, track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all. Yeah. Like friends, pump track, have no idea what the time is. Totally. You know, get home when it's dark, you know? Yeah. Our presence, you know? Yeah. And it's like we can get so focused on yep, the creating and the doing and having and forget about, you know, these these really precious moments and um valuing that appreciating that valuing that beyond anything else because tomorrow is definitely not guaranteed and um you know what really matters is is the deep and meaningful connections and relationships that we have and it's easy to say but to really get that and have that land has been absolutely transformational for me along this journey thank you so much judy i think uh, it feels like we've gone we've always had that great connection and awesome conversations this just Mm -hmm. brings it to a whole new level and yeah you know now everyone's going to be able to listen in (laughs) and um so I'll be able to um send any listeners down to the show notes to check out what Judy's doing she is helping saving lives literally um so yeah I think that'll be really awesome if anyone feels that they they need to reach out to you and connect to you they can thank you Thank you so much. So fun. Thank you so much. It's so such an honor.